Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an oceanographer, ocean, yeah, what am I? <laughs> explorer in residence, National Geographic, founder of Mission Blue. And an ocean elder. And an ocean elder. <laughs> Thank you, ocean elders, for sponsoring this program. Absolutely. And this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. And speaking of wonder and interest, I'm going to attempt to do the screen share. <laughs> it's is, always a wonderful it's always, experience. <laughs> oh my God, right? <laughs> Yay. I don't know where. It's, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming, seriously. There it is, my golly. So it happens when you take a month off. <laughs> a little <laughs> slow on the on the uptake. So um, as we move through the program, we are going to be taking questions and answers, which you can just put into the Q&A box, and we'll get to those at the end of the program and answer as many of them as we can. Um, and before we get started, we'd like to remind everyone that the world is blue. Yes, there it is. Oh no, <laughs> there we go. Um, today we are going to be joined by Dr. Edith Witter. Edie's a longtime friend and collaborator. She's an oceanographer, marine biologist, and co-founder, senior scientist, CEO at ORCA, the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. Edie, if you can uh, jump back in, there you are. Oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> hey there. You're looking very, very dry. <laughs> well, it's like us is here in the library we remain beached <laughs> it's not your normal state though no like you sylvia i prefer being underwater absolutely wet is good <laughs> and and dry is good too if you're inside one of these devices such as what you're here with a wasp yeah a little uh, it's uh, yellow and black and it essentially flies underwater like a wasp right and as you know because you dove the gym suit it's pretty uncomfortable <laughs> yeah but it gets you there and yeah, I, think it gets you when, there. I think that's when we first met face to face that was during dives that you made with bruce robeson and some of your other colleagues off the california coast and yes you, you actually saved my bacon on that particular occasion because i was trying to get an instrument that we built out to the ship and uh, Jim Case was having a meltdown because nobody would get it to us. And you broke in over the radio link when you heard this interchange between me and Case to say you were in, on, do you remember the Thomasina? I think that was the name of it, right? Yep. You, you were on your way out in the Thomasina and, and you could pick it up for us and bring it. Which definitely is, saved me. Right? It's so often the case is, uh, you know, you just have to be ready with a, a quick save and collaboration that way. And it, it really it, makes all the difference. They expect the unexpected. That's right. Adapt <laughs> and overcome. <laughs> there was a lot of that on that first WASP mission. There were a lot of things to overcome. Oh, but it took you into a realm face to face with the creatures that have really been a big piece of your life ever since. Oh, it completely so, changed the course of my career. Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I tell people diving in WASP changed my understanding of the nature of life in the ocean and also changed my understanding of the expression colder than a witch's tit. <laughs> <laughs> That's California diving for you. That's right. Absolutely. Even when you're inside a, a nice, supposedly warm, dry, um, one atmosphere system. There was nothing warm about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging for sure. Metal is a great conductor of cold as well as heat. But you just had a new book come out. I did, yes. And below uh, the edge of darkness, notes from the underwater life. Yeah, yeah I never imagined myself writing a memoir. I I did want to write a book about bioluminescence, but all of the publishers said the same thing. You have to make it more personal. And I didn't think I could do that, but turns out I had a lot of fun doing it. So can you, can you then you got but, but do, do you have do you have your kids' book there? That you oh, did. That, yes, I had done a children's book um, years ago. Uh, there it is. Bio, Bioluminescence coloring books, which we sell with uh, glow in the dark paints. And it turned into a big deal. I mean, I, I 
had pictured no, nothing quite so elaborate when when I started out. Wow. But in order to be able to have the kids be able to paint the the photophores, the light organs and stuff, the it had to be a pretty big thing. And right. then people wanted to know answers to all the questions, and so. Um, I ended up, you know, writing a, a little blurbs with each one, and then they wanted to know what these animals actually look like. So there's your <laughs> oh, beautiful. And then at the back, we ended up having all of these um, games and puzzles to try and reinforce it. Yeah, I had a lot of fun putting that together too. Although, boy, it was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. But oh, the kids imagine. appreciate it. And then you have a new book that's coming in November. Yeah. Da, da, da. This is a heavyweight. Uh, yeah, things have been a lot quieter here now that this is done, thank God. But there's <laughs> a in 2020, people ask, what did you do? Yeah, during... this is a pandemic project. <laughs> <laughs> One good but, thing that came out of it. But what have you got to, you got a whole, yeah. you know, get that out of there. Yes. And they are featuring, ta-da, ah! Twitter. Yeah. And her bio right. and some buddies. Awesome. Yep. So this will be out. This is a this is a secret copy. No one's supposed to. Yeah, have you this. can get your book through Amazon, I believe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yes, yes, mine. Too. Yes. Yeah. Pre-order. Or through our dive shop. Yeah. So. Right. Um, but you know, back on to bioluminescence. I mean, you've just been spending literally. Do you say your life has changed with the dives and wasp? And <laughs> I think Bibi's life was changed too. Yeah, and we've talked so often. Where's that, that book? We're getting to it. Okay. <laughs> Another um, book. Oh man, so often. <laughs> In dive in we've talked about the importance of light in the deep sea and you know most people maybe they've seen some fireflies if they're lucky they might have observed a glow worm yeah but they haven't really seen or most people haven't really seen how much light is in the sea and how abundant it is and there have been some people say that up to three quarters of the animals in the deep sea use uh, light as, a, as their primary communication tool um Edie says it's the most common form of communication on the planet yeah. i think and William Beebe, okay, wait. You could make that case, certainly. So here's his book, Half a Mile Down. Yeah, I um, love that book. It's yeah, written he's before talked, we were born. <laughs> he's talked about the, you know, the 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 real light show that goes on at depth. Um, and even before Wasp, you were interested in in bioluminescence. Can what what first sparked your interest? Uh, actually, I was working on a bioluminescent dinoflagellate, getting a PhD in neurobiology, and I was recording the action potential that triggered the flash, and kind of got naturally interested in how it produced its light. And then um, my major professor, who was brilliant at getting funding, got a major grant for a new kind of spectrometer that could measure very, very dim colors. Uh, and uh, I've always been a gadget freak. So I kind of became the lab expert on it. And he said, well, now that you can make this thing do what you want, I think we need to send you to sea to measure all these animals in the ocean that make light that nobody's ever been able to measure before. And suddenly I was the thing I had always dreamed of being, which was a seagoing marine biologist. It just happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was on a, a series of expeditions. And one of them, they were using this suit and I wasn't trained as a pilot, but I would get on the headsets and talk to whoever was down in the suit. And I asked them to turn out the light and tell me what they'd see. And these supposedly, you know, dry scientists would just give me something like, oh, wow, look at that. That is so <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I got so frustrated. You know, I said, could you be more specific? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they so really, they yeah. couldn't. <laughs> and so Bruce Robeson, who was the chief scientist, kind of took pity on me. And he said, well, you know, if you want to stay around for a couple of years. We're going to do this again. You could get trained up as a pilot. And on the basis of that, I turned down a plum postdoc in Madison, Wisconsin, and um, ended up, you know, staying on and, and doing the dives in WASP. But then when I saw how much luminescence was down there, I just couldn't turn back. I just have yeah. been studying it ever since. It's just phenomenal. I mean, every time that I've been in a submersible, it's just you just see the, the pulses of light and you just you really want to turn off the lights as much as you can just so you can really enjoy that. Well, the exciting thing is we now have cameras that can actually see as much or even a little bit maybe more than the fully dark adapted human eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is what pretty much what it looks like, except you can see a little bit more detail of the color than than your eye can pick out. Right. Uh, and uh, it's just fantastic to be able to share it with the world now because so much of it was just, you know, oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. 
Well, Bibi really enchanted me when I read Half Mile Down as a kid. He talked about the flash, the sparkle, the glow, the, like comets, moons, stars, like a galaxy of creatures, which is, in truth, that's what it's like. Although you think of what's below where sunlight shines as eternal darkness. And except for bioluminescence, it is dark. Sunlight doesn't get much below, you know, what? 300 meters. meters. Yeah, and, and 500 or, and below that, you know, there might be little trickles of photons getting through, but not very, not very much further. And most of the average depth of the ocean, of course, is 4,000 meters. And the maximum, 11,000 meters, but there's bioluminescence all the way. All the way down, you betcha. Yeah. Critters, look at those critters. Squid. They're just amazing looking. <laughs> Fish, little jelly. I don't know what that was in the lower right hand corner is, but it's. That's, that's krill. That's a krill. krill. Of course. All krill are bioluminescent. And mo most of them are blue, but there are some really interesting exceptions. That's a tomopterid worm at the top. Wow. Well, yeah. So beautiful. And there's, isn't there some kind of critter that is red? Yeah, the stoplight fish. They're just <laughs> wonderful. It's it's pretty sneaky because most creatures fish. don't see red yeah. in the deep. Right. It sneaks up on animals that can't see red light, but it can. So it uses its its bioluminescence like a sniper scope. Yeah. Uh, it's always this 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 battle of, you know, eat be eaten, avoid being eaten. But you have to use light as a defense and it, it's it's like having an invisibility cloak. Exactly. Only you and, can see. <laughs> and you can have private conversations with uh, your mate and not worry about attracting attention. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and you've used some of the uh, work that you've done from submersibles to uh, be able to, was it the eye and the sea tool that you developed that was used yeah. to help to um, get the uh, giant squid to be attracted to come and investigate you? So I spent most of my career diving in submersibles. I made hundreds of dives in um, the Johnson Sea Link submersibles. And One as of our well favorite tools. Others, yeah. <laughs> um, and, but I always felt like, you know, how many animals out there that we're scaring away with our bright lights and our noisy thrusters? And I wanted some other way to explore. And so I've developed this camera system called Eye in the Sea that uses red light and actually borrowed from the stoplight fish a technique to get a, a light that um, uh, the animals wouldn't see. And then I uh, had an optical lure that imitated certain kinds of bi bioluminescent displays. And the first time I used it, it recorded a squid that was completely new to science. It was in and the Gulf of Mexico, wasn't that it? That was in the Gulf of Mexico in 2004, yeah. 86 seconds after we turned on the electronic jellyfish for the first time, it recorded a squid over six feet long, completely new to science, not, e not even just a new species or a new genus, it was a new family and a very oh. bizarre squid. Uh, okay. And so then we developed an, another version of the um, eye in the sea that we used to get the giant squid. That's actually the octopus star toothus um, <laughs> that we discovered uh, had bioluminescent suckers. And the reason that discovery ended up on the cover of nature was because it's actually evolution caught in the act. It's suckers turning into light organs. Wow. And it, it kind of confirmed one of the hypotheses about how bioluminescence came to be so prevalent in the ocean. Because as you well know, it's a, a very different environment than we're used to on land because there's no hiding places. There's no trees or bushes or hidey holes. Mm -hmm. And yet you have to, animals have to play all the games of hide and seek that um, they do uh, on land and the only way to hide in the ocean is to go down where it's dark mm -hmm. and so as the ocean filled up with swifter and nastier predators <laughs> the uh, prey either had to evolve to outswim their predators or find a way to hide and and so most of them ended up going down into the dark depths to hide but that takes them away from their food so they'd have to come back up to the surface at night and feed where photosynthesis occurs. And so that has led to the most massive animal migration pattern on the planet, vertical right. migration. So as these animals got pushed into darkness, the selection pressure was to develop 
more sensitive eyes and more um, optimized optical signaling. And with an octopus, you know, if this octopus got pushed out into the deep, dark, open ocean, it didn't need its suckers for hanging onto things on the bottom anymore. Um, but it could still use them for something else an octopus will sometimes use its suckers for, which is they'll throw their arms up over their head to, to show their suckers to a potential mate. It's like a wet t-shirt contest. Look what I've got. <laughs> and right. so now the selection pressure was to make them more visible. And so the cool thing was that when we examined these suckers, we discovered that they, um, uh, you could see the vestigial muscle rings. So they are actually suckers turning light into light organs. So it was evolution actually caught in the act. That's excellent. Really. So cool. There's so many things that we can't really get our minds around until we take ourselves down where the action is. And, it, and really and the, exactly. the time that the submersible provides mm -hmm. for us to, you know, you, yeah. I mean, you couldn't ever imagine getting enough time just diving to observe bioluminescence. <laughs> well, it's, it's not exactly the kind of discovery you would make by dragging a net through the oh, ocean. No, <laughs> Looking absolutely at not. You no, know, you'd have this, this poor thing laying up on the deck after being trawled up. It'd just be awful, you know. Jane Goodall spent 15 years, day and night, living with one species in Gombe in the forest and got to know the creatures there really well. We, we really don't have that luxury yet <laughs> in the ocean, but the gift of time. Yeah, but we're, we're getting there because now we're getting, you know, more and better submersibles. Right. They're, they're becoming less expensive. Um, I, I'm hoping that we're going to have more observational opportunities, both with submersibles and with new camera systems that can be left in the yeah. ocean. And, and kids, to get the kids down there. I love the fact that you wrote a book, but that shouldn't. The way Bibi's book really got to me. I wanted to see what he saw and experience what he wrote about. And uh, fast forward a few decades, and there I was, and there you are. And where are we <laughs> here? Yeah. So this is the bamboo coral, isn't it? Yeah, this is in the Gulf of Mexico, which uh, uh -huh. I mean, just incredible life on the bottom of the ocean. And, you know, it's so important that we get people seeing this because otherwise, you know, when they go out and do bottom trawling and turn that exquisite garden into a moonscape yeah. or Personal. now mining, which would be equally destructive, if not more so. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's all going to go on out of sight and out of mind unless we have this kind of documentation to share with the world. It's absolutely true. It's, you know, it, it totally is out of sight, out of mind, and, and they can really downplay the damage that will occur or that has occurred in areas that are trawled um, it just by virtue of the fact that, that so few people get there to, to see it and appreciate it. And, and, and now we're seeing, you know, how valuable many of these animals can be just in terms of the microbial communities and um, you know, for biomedical research, it's it far outstrips any value that they might potentially have for um, dead know, animals, dead animals, uh, or dead rocks, your <laughs> cell phone batteries, or whatever it is that they want to want yeah. to uh, create with them. It's more of a library than a what a place just to bulldoze uh, and yeah, <laughs> throw away most of what is captured and and the and then the the disruption of the sequestered carbon as well. Exactly. It's all part of the machinery of life on the planet. And we're messing it with, with it without any real understanding of what the possible long-term implications could be. Right. But it's, we know it, it won't be good. No, it's so <laughs> short-sighted. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the, the need right now is so great to increase awareness and get more people hooked on just what a magical place this is. We need to yep. tap into the human instinct for exploration because right. that's one of our best instincts. Well, one of, this is one of the images that should fire that imagination. This is one of those corals we we're just looking at, but it's doing its thing with its flashiness. <laughs> <laughs> Bamboo coral, yeah they're, yeah, they're just amazing. I mean, these undersea gardens are magical in so many different ways. Turn out the lights and watch what happens. And this is some of the bioluminescence we were able to capture in Hawaii, uh, going back to the area where oh, Olivia yeah. walked around on, with the gym suit 
And in 1979, I had my first experience with a bioluminescent coral. And then fast forward to 2016, something like that, that <laughs> where your two sons joined us on this expedition and actually manned the camera. You mentioned the low light level camera. There's a bite of bamboo coral. Yeah, we're using the Pisces submersibles here. Yeah, right. But the uh, we just went with the manipulator arm and and just like touch these guys, and they just like pulse these blue lights. It's, it's a little bit of light coming from the those portholes was enough to. It was a iPhone light, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> Glow. But oh well, yes, I've seen this video. This is magnificent. This yeah. was with, with a camera that DOER um, housed, right? Well, yeah, it's the it was the uh, the Canon uh, low FFH. light camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the four four million ISO. Yeah, <laughs> really yeah, crazy. I mean, this is what I saw back in 1979, but I had no way to record it. Just in right. My but here, oh my goodness, this was again for me a dream come true to be able to share the view to share it and just so incredible and these and then you've also beyond that you here we are you, this is one of the projects we collaborated on and part of the doer team uh, is helping you with this lander but but tell us about the you know these landers so uh we were using the eye in the sea which had to be deployed and recovered with a submersible or a remote operated vehicle and um it, that was getting harder and harder to do harbor branch where i had been employed since 1989 was winding down their um, submersible program. And so uh, I got with a couple of colleagues of mine, Sanka Johnson and Justin Marshall, and we had kind of a brainstorming session about, well, how could we do this where we didn't need a submersible? And so this was the camera system that we developed, which we call the Medusa, because it can either sit on the bottom or it can drift in the midwater. And the very first time I got to test it was on this cruise that Sylvia um, organized to go dive on the site of the BP oil spill. Right. Um, and we had terrible weather and lots of- yeah, You can see everybody's stuff. kind of smoked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was rough seas, but um, we, we got some really critical testing on, and that was the only testing I was able to do on it. And then the next time I used it was off Japan. And that's the camera system that we got the first video ever recorded of a giant squid. Awesome. And that accomplishment of seeing for the first time a giant squid it was huh well until then it was sort of a mythological creature it was the ultimate experience to actually see the architeuthis ducks in its own realm not just a dead body washed up on shore or something that had been lowered near the surface but down where the creatures actually live so and bravo, so Edie, for, for accomplishing that. It was amazing. It was so different than we expected it because, uh, you know, we've seen dead specimens for a long time and studied them because dead squid, hap I mean, giant squid happen to float when they die because they have ammonia in their tissues, which is unusual. Um, but, you know, the dead specimens were always red and that's what we expected it to look like, but it wasn't red. It looked like it was carved out of, brushed aluminum and bronze. It was it was just an amazing, amazing creature. And we had it on camera for 26 minutes. It was incredible. Wow. <laughs> I mean, say 26 minutes to Jane Goodall and she'd say, what? <laughs> but it's the first and only time that the giant squid has actually had that long a, an exposure to human eyes. Yep, and we, that, was in, that was in 2012. Um, and then we did it again in 2019 in U.S. waters in the Gulf of Mexico, but that huh. was a much much shorter um, yeah. exposure. But it just goes to show you, know, it's another one of these great big animals that's sort of out there that we very little is known about them, but they they are global in their um, in their reach, and this really points to the the need to afford it's, greater protection for the you know for these these big areas of the ocean and and, and to really explore be able to explore more. yeah <laughs> directly direct exploration. yeah i mean I, I don't think there's anything that is more of a testament to how little we've explored our own planet that there could be an animal that can grow as tall as a four-story building that had not been seen alive ever yeah, yeah. until just a few years ago yeah 
and yet we knew it existed and we'd been hunting for it. There'd been major expeditions to go hunt for it. Yeah, we, we went with the, you know, the late Mike Degree uh, to New Zealand some years ago on the calamari safari. And, right. uh, <laughs> and, and they, you know, they tried all kinds of things, but this kind of prior to your development of the, of the lures um and just yeah, try think like a giant square right which and is what you did exactly <laughs> so that's the you know that's the real difference is is having the tools uh, developing these technologies and then really having the opportunity to go into the field and and experiment with them uh, to get these kinds of results and it's it's so frustrating is it you know coming back to this to the deep sea mining for a minute is this huge investment that's being made in you know how fast can we extract and, and go down there and, and disrupt these ancient systems um, versus how like valuable they are. Yeah. And how, yeah. how just infuriating it is to, to just try to let get the crumbs of funding that is needed, yeah. needed to go out and do these and investigations. And to see how valuable they are alive. Yeah. In yeah. I, I, I think an awful lot of the public is unaware of how chronically underfunded deep sea exploration has always been. Yeah. Um, a tiny tiny fraction of what's ever been put into space exploration exactly. and, and it's so illogical when you realize that we're talking about our planetary life support systems here 70 percent of the planet <laughs> yeah when, when i was chief scientist at NOAA in the early 1990s i did my utmost to try to get excitement about having support i mean real national support for deep sea exploration and I suggested, I mean, why not? Let's let's think about a hundred million dollars for starters. And and I remember one of the senior executives just shaking their head and saying, Sylvia, we wouldn't know how to spend a hundred million dollars to explore the ocean. Oh, <laughs> I said, just try us. Yeah, just, yeah. just give us a chance. Give us a chance, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Anyway, that's a drop in the bucket when you talk about going high in the sky. Yeah. And we need yeah. it going deep. We really do. Now you can see the camera system kind of poking out there. And, and these are the red light, the red lights that are yeah. helping to um, make you invisible. Make you invisible. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's you, you can key. see, but the rest of the creatures cannot or do not. Ah, onward into yeah. another page we in our history. Yeah. You know, on Dive In, we so, well, Every episode, we remind people that you know water connects us all, <laughs> um, and I think that you know, take a little er turn here and, and talk about the um, incredible work you've been doing there in the Indian River area of, of Florida, where you are based, um, and looking at these water systems and the the things that we do on the land, which are dramatically impacting not only our fresh water that we all rely on for just for survival. But the impacts is having right offshore to the, the mangroves, the seagrass beds, um, the oyster shoals, and all these things that connect on out into the deep sea. Um, just some tremendous impacts. Um, yeah, so I, um, when uh, Harbor Branch was winding down their submersible program, I was looking to move on. But it was right about then that uh, the 2003 Pew Oceans Commission report came out and the 2004 US Commission on Ocean Policy reports. And they were pretty devastating uh, indictments of what was happening to the ocean. And I felt like I couldn't just go on in academia. I wanted to do something more direct and um, <laughs> make this shift from basic science to applied science. Um, and so ORCA was the result, which um, was, it's a 501c3 that uh, I helped found in 2005. Um, ORCA stands for Ocean Research and Conservation Association. And we've been focusing on estuaries, specifically this one right here, which is 156 miles long and was once called the most biologically diverse estuary in the United States. Um, it's a, a breeding ground for manatees. It's you know a, a huge um, bird reserve. A lot of migratory birds stop over here. There's dolphins. There's you know stingrays. It's it's a, an exquisite place, but it's collapsing. It's yeah. turning into an algae-dominated system. And so you know we've been trying to do the kind of science that um, will 
be able to track pollution to its source. So our tagline is mapping pollution and finding solutions. And we do that from all the way from the high tech that one on the left is um, satellite imagery. Uh, we've been working with um, uh, remote sensing to develop algorithms that can track toxic algae blooms. Um, the next panel over is the Kilroy water quality monitor system that we've developed to um, do real-time monitoring of the um, various canals and tributaries that feed into the lagoon. Could, we could you just say why you call it Kilroy? Well, that was because I'm old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows anymore what Kil Kilroy was, but he, you know, he was a little Uber GI of World War II fame. That, um, and we wanted ours, our Kilroy, to be everywhere, like like Kilroy was here, was everywhere. Right. Um, and so the name is stuck, but I still have to explain it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't and have it, to explain it to me. I'm old, uh, <laughs> <laughs> old enough. And then we. Um, we take, we've been doing pollution maps like the one in the center there where it's like a weather map where red is hot and blue is cold, only red is the pollution and blue is the clean areas. And these have proved very powerful for showing people where the problems are originating. Like you see there in the bottom right hand corner, that's a typical Florida community that I know that Sylvia is very familiar with where you've got uh, these dug out deep water docks mm -hmm. um, and you've got sloping grass lawns right down to the edge of a seawall and all of the um, fertilizer and grass clippings and pesticides all end up in Boom. the, right the muck at the bottom and it ends up being a breeding ground for the toxic algae blooms which you see in the next panel which we're having more and more of um, i mean this is a worldwide problem um, but in the this estuary it's it's become very serious it's impacting um the uh economy of the state because it's uh, the two major incomes for Florida are tourism and real estate. And, yeah. you know, people don't want to come and swim in toxic algae or live next to it. No, so that's, it is, the dolphins don't have any choice. And I remember those pictures that you sent me once about the trouble that the dolphins, the, the, the yeah, the, they have the cauliflower oh. fungus called lobomycosis. Yeah, it's really alarming, and you you know how sensitive their skin is. They must be miserable. And yeah. there's no it's really alarming. Yeah, it's just like with the when you know, with the BP oil spill when they decided to spray it with dispersant, the animals could there was no way they could avoid it at all. It was just completely dispersed within the water they had to swim through. No, it actually made it so much worse for the so much worse. It's just uh, yeah, stupid and. And you know this thing with the lawns. I mean, looks like you've got a lawn out there in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, but that's more this toxic algae. Yeah. And you know the toxicity is is alarming on many levels. I mean, it, you know, it has an acute effect. We had a big uptick in hospitalizations when we had a major that major bloom. Um, but uh, it's also long term effects, and there's evidence of um, impacts. Uh, in the long term, in terms of liver cancer for something like microcystin, um, and then there's another chemical produced by a lot of blue green algae that is now linked to Alzheimer's, right. um, Lou Gehrig's disease, and Parkinson's. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things that we need to be paying attention to, or they're going to be impacting us for a long time to come. Right, and it, you know, it's this, and that's the sort of thing that it it seems to take for you know whatever reason, but until for so many people until they can see that there's a cohesive link between the environmental damage and their own health yeah they they don't pay attention to it but once but they this realize is very it, direct human very direct. health and the ocean. health of the natural system in especially the ocean the ocean governs planetary chemistry it's the basis of our life support system and look at this just contaminating the very systems that keep us alive and and just so you can have that you know huh. emerald green lawn i mean honestly seriously <laughs> why <laughs> yeah uh, actually we just did a, a really interesting um study with the city of stewart where um they we did a demonstration project in one of their um parks and we did before and after measurements of the runoff um that was going into the lagoon uh, before with just the, the sloping grass lawns and after where we landscaped with um, buffer zones. And 
I, I'm frankly shocked at how much of a difference it made. I mean, I thought it was going to improve it, but it, it's it's so enormous that um, I, you know I'm starting to beat that drum really loud. I, there, one of our problems in the lagoon and everywhere else is that there is no one smoking gun that you can point to. There's different pollutants in different parts of the lagoon that are problematic, but they all come from the same source, which is stormwater runoff. And right. so if slow the flow. If that is our focus is just slow the flow with buffer zones and swales and living shoreline, then we can get rid of this. You're seeing that this black mayonnaise that is coating the bottom of the lagoon, smothering all everything down there. We've measured it as much as 10 feet deep in some places. Wow, that's a, it's shocking. It's, well, it's appalling. And one of the other things that, that is a real contributor, I think, is is just this rampant overpaving of everything you know we just we just pave 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 and that just accelerates the runoff um from the streets and all the chemicals that, that are laying out on the on the roadways and and i like to say you know like how much of your body could you cover in duct tape how much of your skin could you cover in duct tape and expect it to perform normally or yeah or that's well? exactly right what we want to do is is get rid of the gray funnel and turn it back into a green filter right um, exactly yeah, like and, that. and then the water can you know trickle down into the aquifer the way it's supposed to being cleaned on the way we Recharge need to recharge the our aquifers yep yeah, exactly right uh it could make a huge difference so you know you you look at this map and you can see that in the close-up on the right there that's the community i talked about well on the left hand shore that's all mangrove and you see how clean that is by Imagine that. <laughs> yeah it, it yeah. makes a huge difference it's something um, we can actually do it's achievable it's a, it's very achievable and and the thing with the Indian River Lagoon is we don't have any big industrial inputs that other estuaries have to deal with, so we could turn this around. We could really save this um, estuary, and it it's so much more than the estuary itself. That's the point I keep trying to hammer home. So many open ocean animals come in here to br to breed right. because of the hiding places that it affords. Oh, this is my own backyard. Um, so I I live on one <laughs> of the deep water dock communities, which I I didn't had no idea when we bought you know how bad it was, and now we've done everything we can to try to make up for it. So um, that's the lawn on the left hand side there that it used to be there, and we've replaced it with a swale with a French drain under it. We collect every bit of water that comes off of our roof, and on, uh, and it all goes into French drains that feed into a tank that then we then use to irrigate our lawn. Those are all native plants um, on, uh, in the swale. And then on the front facing of the seawall, we've got something called reef wall that is uh, cement created in the shape of mangrove roots and uh, with oyster shell ground up in it. Um, hmm. And it turns out to be really effective in recruiting oysters. So it's everything we could think of to do that would help make a difference in terms of assuring that nothing comes off of our property that's bad for the Indian River Lagoon. Right. So people can do that no matter where they are. Look at what your backyard or in your community, if you don't have a backyard, you you live somewhere. Right. And things, you have a voice. You have things influence. everyone can do, you know. And I remember yeah. growing up in in Florida, uh, we always used to have like the roadside swale. Uh, and then they came along and they they dug all those out and they put in, you know, covered culverts. So now the rainwater can't even get in there. It just accelerates and shoots the the runoff from the street out into the bay and just and took like it was a really awesome natural system, uh, full of plants, full of I mean oh, yeah. frogs and toads and little <laughs> baby catfish and everything we used to catch as kids, <laughs> and just eliminated it to shunt that water as quickly as possible out into the into the bay um along with all that load of of toxins yeah so exactly. so now now we know better you know it's, and we need to do better now we know better <laughs> but even just the you know simple rain garden that like you say captures that water that comes off a person's roof um you can either have like a you know barrel rain barrels to help with irrigation or to just put it right into a swale system um, right and it doesn't have that, to be as you point out people that are on waterfront property because inland you see this all the time. The yard crews come and they cut the grass and they blow the grass clippings into the gutters, which oh feed God, directly right? into drains that go directly <laughs> into the Indian River Lagoon. There's no baffle boxes or anything. No, no. It's so so and 
Um, so these are things that, you know, just anybody can do. And, and it doesn't even, even if you're in an apartment complex, you can go to the managers and say, look, you know, we really want to make a difference. Just slow that, that flow of rainwater when it comes down and not have it just sort of rush over pavement and, and down the closest uh, storm drain. That's the key, I think, is just slow the flow. Right. I think there's some questions coming in. I know that they'd love to, I would love to ask more of you, Edie, we, <laughs> but let's hear from some of our viewers. All right, let's see. We've got a few questions queued up here. Ah. Sorry. <laughs> um, since SpaceX and Virgin are offering paid trips into space, why is it not possible for people to pay to go into the deep ocean? As a retired oceanographer, I would pay for it in a heartbeat. That's from oh. Deborah. <laughs> Well, we know a few people that would like to help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's definitely an interest in developing a tourist industry. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we're very close to that happening. It, the cost of submersibles has gone down to the point where, you know, you can get a three person submersible for a million dollars approximately. And um, that's, you know, in the realm of possibility for wealthy people that they have them on their, their yachts now. Yeah, I've seen the yacht ones for a long time. We've supported a bunch of those in the past. And, um, but you know, the, the real goal is to just, like you say, make, build more of them, make them more accessible and, and kit them up so that they can do meaningful um, work for science alongside, um, you know, taking paying passengers down. Yeah. And, and democratize access to the sea in a positive way right now. Those who get to go for military, industry, and in some cases, it's growing uh, tourism. Yeah. But there's still this gap. We need to have meaningful exploration where you actually can document and share the view. And really, the tools are getting better, but it's been so hard to just raise nickels and dimes to get to the access that that is that will really be transformative. Mm -hmm. It's like the early days of aviation in a way. Well, I may be being too optimistic, but I really do feel like we, we might be just on the edge of that coming to into fruition. Yeah. Okay. Sandra uh, is asking, can you please speak to the phosphate mining industry and issues in Florida and how mm. it affects these ecosystems, fauna and marine life? Yeah, that's so. Piney Point. Ah. <laughs> when I saw Piney Point, this crisis, I was just like, "Sweet Mother of Venus, <laughs> why, why do we still have these 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 big contaminated ponds, and why are, why are we failing to make the investment in cleaning up this water that we've that we've fouled up over the years and make the polluter pay, if you will? Yeah, well, they, yeah. they've, they've gone out of business. Is what usually happens is they you know they just. Uh, kind of cut and run and, and they leave these big pools of contaminants. Yes. Just, just a, a, a horrible, horrible mess. And, and we've got so many situations like that everywhere yeah. of, you know, dumps, toxic dumps that aren't being monitored. No. And, and this is something that we really need to be focusing on developing more real-time monitoring that, you know, is our monitoring the life support systems of the planet you yeah. know if you're, if you're sick and you go into an emergency room the first thing they do is start monitoring your life support systems to figure out what's wrong and then figure out what, what they're doing is making you better and not worse we need to be doing the same thing on our planet and a lot of this stuff you're not going to be able to see it you actually have to be out there with technology measuring it we yeah. have the capability we just have to in, instead what happened in florida is with the economic downturn in 2008, that was a use as an excuse to cut all kinds of monitoring and eliminate all kinds of environmental protections. And, and we're now suffering for it in a big way. Yeah. So I really salute you, Edie, Edie the engineer, <laughs> Edie the scientist, the biologist, many things, but turning your attention to developing, you call it Kilroy, call it what you will, the monitoring systems that compared to some of the other technologies out there 
that are much more expensive. You've made them affordable and deployable so that they can be made available in large numbers in many places. And we need more of that. We really do Yeah, we need to scale up what you're doing. And then, and really make the investment in figuring out the ways and means that we can, you know, recover and clean and remediate these, these toxic pools that we've right. left behind because that's fresh water most of the time. Um, or, or coastal areas. Or coastal generally. areas, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, our, the, the amount of fresh water that we have is finite and our numbers keep growing and more people want, you know, <laughs> be able to have a, you know, water security. So it, it really is a very imperative that we figure out ways to, to fix the damage that we've done. Yeah. It's and it's not just that it's, it's, uh, the handling of human waste. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Why are we conveying it with fresh water anymore? <laughs> oh, it, it, yeah. That that's incredibly short-sighted. And then the spreading of biosolids, Mm -hmm. on agricultural land the contaminants of emerging concern that are then being put into our food web and not being tested for um, is truly alarming and there is technology now that could so clean up um, and deal with this uh, and in an economic manner it, yeah. it, it, there's money to be made in it actually <laughs> There is money to be made in it. You're exactly yeah. right. Um, and and those, yeah. no. Yeah. No. <laughs> and it, you know, um, communities that have invested in advanced wastewater treatment have benefited enormously from it. And we, we need to be pointing to those as uh, examples that we need to be following. Yeah. So both to capture the the safe water and to use the what would otherwise be contaminants as an asset. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. George is uh, asking, has anyone come up with an alternative for golf courses to stop <laughs> fertilizing? God forbids us from asking golfers to plant sustainable grass that doesn't need nitrogen and phosphorus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the advantage of actually doing real science and measurements because um, I was very surprised that uh, a couple of the clean spots that we found were right next to golf courses. Wow. And so the first one that we found that at was the Vero Beach Country Club. And um, I, you know, I was shocked and I went and talked to them and it turned out they use a low dose organic liquid fertilizer. They bag all of their grass clippings and they don't poison their water hazards. And um, and then the Moorings Golf Course is surrounded by living shoreline. It's it's completely surrounded by um, uh, mangroves and nice. the water around it is clean. And uh, so a lot of these Audubon certified um, golf courses are actually doing a really good job. Uh, the, the, the golf, the groundskeepers have to have a degree and they know a lot about what needs to be done. If they just have um, membership that will back them, they, right. can, they can go a long way. To, so you can still play golf um, and, but you, we just have to figure out the right way to handle it so we don't get runoff. And so they're not using Roundup everywhere. That's oh, another. Yeah. Should be a banned substance, period. Yeah. <laughs> pretty bad stuff. It's really bad. Well, there was a time, and it's still true in places, where you're told not to go barefoot on a golf course because of the chemicals that could be da damaging to you. But the birds don't know. No, of course not. They, they can't, they don't have a, they don't have shoes. No, <laughs> let alone the reptiles and amphibians. Yeah. Much more yeah, susceptible. Frogs, frogs yeah. Absolutely. So, All those insects yeah, that are good. Anyway. good. <laughs> okay, Jenny said, asks, what was the most unexpected or surprising experience you've had with bioluminescence in the deep sea? Ooh. Oh, there've been so many, um, but one of the standouts was, uh, um, we were chasing a gulper eel one time um, and managed to catch it with the detritus samplers, you know, the, the big samplers on the front of the sub and brought it back up into the lab. And you know, it, this is such a weird animal. You know, it's got this huge pelican like mouth and it's got a light organ on the end of its tail. <clears throat> and it also had <clears throat> racing stripes down either side that are they thought were luminescent, but nobody had ever seen it. So I wanted to get it um, out of the detritus sampler when we got it up on the ship and get it into a dark room. 
So uh, I, we gathered quite a crowd in the wet lab and I was you know, pulling the lid back and reached in and had a, a finger bowl that I was lifting it out with. And it was under fluorescent lights and that racing stripe lit up so bright that everybody gasped. Had to be the brightest bioluminescence I've ever seen. Wow. I mean, I have no idea what the actual photon flux was, but it was enormous. And that fish is such a great example of how little we understand about bioluminescence in the ocean. I mean, what the heck is it doing with the tail light on the end of this really long tail? Is it doing yoga and dangling it in front of its mouth? <laughs> yeah, kind of a lure what type is thing. Using the racing stripes for probably to yeah, blind, a, you know, attacker, but still, yeah. it, it that's that's craziness. Yeah. <laughs> In the of the best possible kind, right? I think of the fucking craziness about the lawns and things. <laughs> but that's that's good crazy. Yeah. This is good crazy. Yeah, yeah, I love the bioluminescence. Let's see the question here. Abby is asking, um, what impact has the past year with the pandemic, or how's the pandemic affected marine life and the ecosystem? Yeah, I was hoping that things would be better, you know, that, but actually there's been a lot more boat traffic around here. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of people have been getting out in their boats to try to escape the pandemic. And so um, I don't think it's helped all that much. Yeah. I haven't seen any obvious benefits. In some places, it's been the opposite. The boats have stayed tied up rather than being out, especially large boat traffic shut down for a while. I don't think it's true presently, but there are reports about orcas coming in closer to shore mm. and dolphins likewise, and even the large whales coming closer to shore because there wasn't so much activity, including the noise that is generated by ship traffic, boat traffic. Right. So it depends, I guess, where you are <laughs> what the what the impact has been so for well, me I'm right, I'm right next to a stretch of waterway that's sometimes called the redneck riviera so <laughs> <clears throat> the go faster boat and the jet ski and all that yeah and the poor manatees that you have to try to dodge it all it's just oh the manatees are having a really rough year yeah year. yeah between starving and being run over and the pollution yeah, yeah. and the pollution yeah. no that's true so knowing what it, what's possible is really a big step toward restoring back to that to a better time. Yeah. If you if you don't know what it could be like, you just think that what we've got now is normal, which it obviously you need to those of us who've seen normal, <laughs> well at least better than what is now. Yeah. That we can do better. We really can change things, and it really re requires personal action as well as collective action so right. everybody can do what they can do in their own backyard and consumers can consumers can really help by you know if they are going to buy a watercraft you know really thinking about what its impacts are going to be and right you know do you get a, a jet boat versus a prop boat do you get you know do you actually ask questions about you know how much noise does this thing produce what's under the boat what's under the boat yeah <laughs> so who, who is under the who's boat? under the boat yeah. and and try to pick something that's appropriate and you know, with, with some compassion and kindness for the animals that live in the area. Yeah, so I, I, I believe that there's some of the um, boat manufacturers are now starting to work on uh, more advanced electric motors, um, right. which would be a big help because these two stroke engines release so yeah. many hydrocarbons into the water. It's really a, a severe part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, for sure. And it's a new problem. I mean, relative to the time that people have been in, on, and around the ocean. The, the level of noise, contamination, disturbance, whatever it is, since the middle of the 20th century has really scaled up enormously. Yeah, it's amazing. Nowhere is it more evident than in Florida. Yeah. OK, Martin is asking, how can the Slow the Flow campaign uh, if you run in other parts of the world, like, like New Zealand, how can mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses be used rather than destroyed to clean our waterways and sequester mm. carbon? Yep, good yeah, question. We, 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 we need to really be focusing on this junction between the land and the sea, because that's where so much of the damage is being done, and that's where slow the flow could have the biggest impact. 
Um, and, and so, you know, it's just, it's to some extent anyway, an awareness campaign. Um, but there's other ways that we can get uh, moving on this. So um, I've been trying to push the idea of uh, replacing seawalls with living shorelines, which is what I would have liked to have done here, but um, the Homeowners Association wouldn't, wouldn't allow us to do that. But if we could get in front of the secondary insurance industry and talk to them about the fact that um, living shorelines stand up much better to sea level rise and stormwater damage. And everybody has to replace their seawall at some time. So if the insurance industry would incentivize homeowners to replace their seawall with a living shoreline, it's a win-win-win situation. The insurance company wins because um, they'll end up not having to pay out so, many, so much on damages. The homeowner wins um, because you know, it, it um, will clean up the, the water and you know, provide a, a much healthier habitat. I mean, the environment wins, Every, everybody wins on, on a situation like that. We talked about that with uh, when we had John Englander uh, uh, on one of our previous episodes and how the insurance companies really are stepping up in some areas to say, look, you know, act or else we're not going to insure you anymore. This is um, for sea level rise. For sea level rise. Right. And but also for some of these areas that are could be heavily damaged by, um, you know, hurricanes, cyclones, things like this, because it's so uh, proven that the mangroves, the seagrass meadows, the, the coral reefs, reefs and shoals, shore, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that they absorb the so oysters, much oysters, the oysters that they absorb so much energy as it's coming in. It really um, just kind of puts a damper on on some of that uh, storm energy and helps these communities to be more resilient. And as you say, have a, a much lower uh, claim rate with the with the insurance companies. Right. So it's just yeah, it's smart all the way around. But I. I totally agree that the way to, to do it is give the, the financial incentive and the insurability of these properties. I think the other uh, thing that's coming into focus is in connection with climate change, that the blue carbon that is captured and sequestered by living shorelines, the mangroves, the seagrass meadows, the marshes, and even the living ocean beyond, the, the forests of plankton, the good algae. <laughs> the ones, right. I mean, there are no bad ones really, but the idea that we create a circumstance that is favorable to some species that just really like the high levels of, of contamination that are uh, in, in the ocean or in the, in the fresh waters. Uh, a few prosper, all the others sort of get out of town, they die. Um, so, knowing is the key and understanding the cause and effect and realizing that we're the we're the problem yeah we can also be the solution we have to be the solution <laughs> all right aloha is asking we have astronomy observatories like on mauna kea shared by multiple nations huh. what are your thoughts on creating ocean observatories shared by multiple nations for education and research purposes I love that idea. I, I've talked about that on a number of occasions. You know, we, we have the International Space Station. We should have an inter international ocean station. One of the ideas I promoted years ago was the idea of trying to use one of these jack-up um, uh, oil rigs mm -hmm. that once it's been decommissioned by the oil company, it could become a station an international station where you you know you could operate off of it and actually move it to different places in the ocean um, if it's a jack up uh, and be able to do you know have that stable platform because there's a lot of as a neurobiologist I used to think about you know wanting to have a stable platform <laughs> to to be able to do neurophysiology on some of these animals you know there's a lot of stuff you can't do on a ship but if you're out at sea you can get animals alive and work with them and there, there, there could be a, a lot of opportunity for um, international efforts. Yeah. I, love, I love the idea, but it should be plural stations. Yeah. yeah. Regionally, yeah. you know, you could have, because there's so much uh, infrastructure there that, that could be adaptively reused and repurposed for, um, for an observatory system. And underwater yeah. as well. Yeah. There's yeah. a few ocean observatories. You know, we, we do a lot of work out at Station Aloha, which is the deepest ocean observatory. 
cable right. observatory and then of course the you know neptune up in canada and a, a few others uh, here and there but there's certainly not enough for us to really get good no comparative data from no we need to have enough so that you can connect the dots and look at patterns yeah and also to allow for human observations to actually be in the ocean the instrumentation is vital but we also need to take ourselves down the way you have gone many times Edie. but we need others and i especially want to get the kids out there <laughs> i mean if I, when i read william Beebe's book many years ago, if I had been able to have access to a submersible, I, I don't know, my, I probably would have wound up doing what I'm doing <laughs> inevitably anyway, but I could have gotten a jump start. Jump start, exactly. <laughs> all right, we're gonna have two more questions. Oh, we're right. kind of at the top of the hour, but we'll just take these two more. All right. um, let's see, Bridget is asking, hello and thank you. I'm interested in education for marine and coastal sustainability, developing interdisciplinary curriculum for k-12 to tackle these complex problems is there a curriculum model that teaches sustainability that you've seen that is excellent oh that teaches sustainability i was already with another answer <laughs> um, <laughs> um i'm sure there is i i'm just drawing a blank at the moment um yeah what i was going to say is um we do have um kilroy academy dot org um, which uh, allows real-time access to all of our uh, real-time water quality monitors. And um, we have a lot of um, uh, training sessions and videos and hands-on activities and all of these things that can teach, you know, uh, about uh, the characteristics that the Kilroy measure like temperature and salinity and that kind of depth. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that, that's- Great place to start. That would yeah. be a place to start. And we do have references there to other um, sources, but um, COSI, I mean, the Center for Ocean Science Education Excellence, I think had some sustainability programs, but I'm, I'm not remembering specifics at the moment. Right. Okay. So yeah, I think <laughs> the most important thing you can do about ocean education across the border, just whatever it is, go get wet, get the kids out there, look at, you know, we need the curriculum, we need the books, we need the various means of communication, but there's nothing as effective as getting out there and having an experience yourself as a kid or as a grown up. I, I keep saying no child left dry. <laughs> I know you didn't stay dry, Edie. No, I none didn't. of us. You didn't. No. But. but in today's more complicated world with many people not venturing beyond their own sort of what they regard as safe zone in cities or, or in even towns, but find a good wild place, whether it's a beach or a national park or a state park or whatever it is, go soak it up. Just imagine yourself as a part of nature and that realize that we as humans have in such a short period of time altered the nature of nature. And we've done it largely in ignorance, not knowing or caring about the consequences. But now we do know why we should care. And we do know that there are things that we can do to turn from planetary decline to recovery. And maybe ultimately the goal is finding a place for ourselves, a sustained place, sustainability within the natural systems that give us everything, especially our existence. Our life support system, as you refer to it, Edie, mm -hmm. we need to know about it so we can take care of it. And everybody can do it. Everybody can do it. Everybody should do it. Be part of the solution yeah all right all right go <laughs> william is asking do you know about the eu's ocean collaboration called alant eco which is an ambitious endeavor to achieve the idea of international collaboration i don't you no, so no. No, that's new to me no we but the idea of collaboration is is it's not new <laughs> is not new um and, and we really do need some of the you know the 
I don't know, a library that, that really works for both historical data and new data that's coming in. So we really can kind of get a better idea of measuring change over time. And if we're doing a, a good job in, in some of these uh, repair efforts that we have underway. It's kind of like you're doing with the hope spots and you and you with the Indian River area right. um, engaging people who are champions of these locally. areas locally mm -hmm. and having them really take some ownership and then sharing the things that work in once in one area and then you know kind of transplanting them to others whether it's through curriculum or or planting oysters planting or oysters <laughs> or whatever it happens to be but these are yeah, all ways we have a very big um citizen science program because i do think that that is the key uh to getting people wet as you say you know to get them out into nature the the only places people are going to want to live in the future are where communities have come together to protect the local ecosystem yeah otherwise you're just going to be surrounded by toxic waste and toxic algae and, and you know nobody's going to want to live there no. um, and so you've got to get a, a community that is well versed in what it takes to maintain the health of the ecosystems. Yeah, look at the salt and sea, by example. <laughs> you know, it's just everybody was buying up property. They're like crazy for so many years, and the the ecosystem just died, and and now it's a wasteland. No one wants to be there. Yeah, exactly. And that that's going to happen again and again and again unless we, you know, get smarter. Wise up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wise up and act. You know. Yeah. So. Well, we were, we've kind of run past the top of the hour a little bit, um, but thank you so much, Edie. We really appreciate it. It's great to catch up with you. Oh, it's lovely to see you both. We need, we need to get out to you with it with it out in a submersible. Let's all go together. Yes. <laughs> oh, anytime. You know me. Yeah, I do. I know we don't have to twist the flipper too hard, right? No. <laughs> the urge to submerge. It's... Yeah. But before we close today, um, we'd just like to say thank you to everyone that tuned in, all of our guests, the ocean community, and and mostly to our producer, the Ocean Elders. Uh, dive in really feels like home to us, and we we hope that uh, you feel like it's home here in the in the library. <laughs> we really appreciate you uh, joining us, and we're just grateful to everyone. Um, we're going to be back next time with Don Wright, Dr. Don. Um, we'll be talking about geographic information systems and the roles that they play in science. And the company that she is serves as the chief scientist. That's Esri. Esri. Yeah. And. And anybody that out there has some uh, ocean Lego creations, send us a picture. She <laughs> very into Legos, yeah. yeah, she's really into Legos. So if you have some ocean theme thing that you've created, um, we'd like to have those for, for her uh, critique. <laughs> but until then, remember, take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it because it does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's great to be All back right. and we'll see you next time. Thank you again, Edie. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Onward <laughs> and downward. Uh -huh.